We're going to be talking about conjunctions, trines, sextiles, squares, and oppositions. Right? That's all we're going to be talking about? Those are the major aspects? Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Hello and welcome or welcome back to my channel. If you don't know me, my name is Nina. I'm a Western tropical astrologer who's been studying astrology since 2014 and reading professionally since 2017. And today I want to make a video just simply breaking down all of the major aspects and what they mean. I've been thinking of doing more aspect videos on this channel and because you probably know I have the tendency to ramble a little bit. I thought that it would be good to have this clarifying video so that I don't have to break down every time what a certain aspect means. So without further ado, let's get into all of the major aspects. Starting with conjunctions. Conjunctions happen when two planets are within a 10 degree orb of each other. Frequently they are in the same sign, but two planets can be not in the same sign and be conjunct and be in the same sign and not be conjunct. It's all about how far away from each other they are. Well, sometimes you hear 10 degree orb, sometimes you hear 8 degree orb. It depends on what chart calculator you're using. And aspects are usually categorized in either harmonious aspects or non-harmonious aspects, but the conjunction is a wild card. Certain planets are really great to have conjunct, and certain planets are not extremely favorable to have conjunct. It depends on if one of these planets is a malefic planet and might just be fucking another planet up by being too close to it because when two planets are conjunct it means that they are strongly strongly influencing each other in the case of sun conjunct moon this is really great because it means that your sense of self and your inner world your inner self is totally aligned these are two things that you don't want to have in conflict and you know a trine is really nice a sextile is really nice but a conjunction just means that they're totally and completely aligned. But if you have Uranus conjunct Venus, that's not necessarily the best thing in the world because Uranus is a malefic planet and Venus is a benefic planet. And so Uranus is just kind of fucking up Venus's flow by being like, no, you don't want commitment. You want to be free. And Venus is like, well, my whole thing is that I want to connect to other people. And Uranus is like, no, other people suck. Be on your own, you know? Um, and then there's things like Neptune. Neptune is that planet that kind of borders on being a malefic planet and a benefic planet. Um, so Neptune could conjunctions like say Neptune conjunct the Sun has really great qualities of making someone very artistic and intuitive but also gives that person a disillusioned sense of self sometimes so Neptune is kind of like that wild card a conjunction can be really nice like with Venus a lot of times because it gives you that kind of Pisces Venus quality of being really capable of unconditional love but at the same time that Neptune conjunct Venus can make you really disillusioned by people so Neptune is a flip-flopper wild card and that's the conjunction really basic whatever two planets are conjunct or three planets or whatever planets are conjunct are just really speaking to each other arm in arm <laughs> working together and operating one in the same a lot of times a good thing to bring up here is i've mentioned this before but when you're reading aspects you always want to say that the farther planet away in relationship to the sun is influencing the planet that is closer to the sun. So a Venus-Neptune conjunction is Neptune conjunct Venus. Neptune is influencing Venus. Venus is not influencing Neptune. 
Venus is a personal planet. It's coming from you and your expression of love and your values. And Neptune is a outer planet. It's endowing you with these rose tinted glasses. It's endowing you with psychic abilities and intuition and all of these things. So in a Neptune Venus conjunction, Neptune is endowing Venus with Neptune qualities. Moving on to trines. Trines are probably the best aspect you can find in most cases. They still have their troubles, but out of all the aspects, there's a really great aspect to have. With a trine, the two planets forming a trine are creating a 30 degree angle, 60 degree angle. I'm not so much about the math. I think they're creating a 30 degree angle. Feel free to correct me on that. Um, a lot of times they're happening between planets that are in element compatible signs like two air signs two fire signs but again it all has to do with the orb so not all planets that are within element compatible signs are trining and not all trines are within element compatible signs chart calculators will do all the work for you so you don't have to worry about calculating of like the orbs and degrees and whatever but that's just a fun fact to know Trines are a harmonious aspect because, like I said, oftentimes they are in element compatible signs. So the idea is that trines are two planets that are really on the same wavelength. They're communicating with each other in a very harmonious way and they're influencing each other in a positive way, but they are not hand in hand, one in the same, influencing each other too much. They're still, you know, their own planet, but they have a strong influence to another planet. And again, same rule applies. The further out planet from the sun, it's influencing the closer planet to the sun. Great example of this is Mars trine Venus because Mars is a malefic planet, but Mars trine Venus is a really great aspect because it just means that your idea of sex and your idea of love are really strongly tied together. They're not completely dependent on each other, but chances are if you have Venus trine Mars, you are going to be sexually attracted to the same people that you find valuable as partners. So it's a really great aspect to have. Now thinking about Mars influencing Venus, it also creates a lot of passion in relationships, but a healthy amount of passion, healthier than the conjunction, definitely. Where you don't associate throwing their belongings off of the balcony if they piss you off in a relationship like the conjunction possibly will, but you want and you associate sexual compatibility as a very important component in a romantic relationship of value. Saturn is another malefic planet. If it is trine the sun, for example, it just endows you with that good stuff of Saturn, of being a very tenaciously disciplined person who is more likely to achieve success in your lifetime. So that's the trine, a harmonious communication between two planets. The sextile is pretty similar. The sextile creates a 60 degree <laughs> angle in the sky between two planets, and typically it happens between two element similar signs. So if you don't know a lot about element compatibility, you know with a trine it's the same element and with a sextile they're element similar. As in fire and air are grouped together and earth and water are grouped together. So uh, Venus in Capricorn and Mars in Pisces could very well sextile. Again though, it has to do with the orb and whether they're actually forming that angle in the sky. How similar are the degrees of those planets to each other? So not every sextile is between two planets and elements similar 
signs and not every two planets and elements similar signs form a sextile. Like let's take me for example. My moon is at 22 degrees Sagittarius and my Mars is at, I think it's at five degrees Libra. Um, so Sagittarius, fire, Libra, air, great. Those two element wise might be forming a sextile, but 22 degrees and five degrees are really different from each other. And those do not make an angle in the sky that form a sextile. A sextile is pretty similar to a trine. It's just not as strong. Like there's kind of a rapport between those planets. They're slightly influencing each other, but they're a not going to create such a strong relationship where it will be powerful enough to achieve all of the benefits of having two planets trine and b they're also in terms of a malefic planet aspecting a benefic planet it's not going to be strong enough to create that many problems. But problems can arise a little more than with a trine. In terms of a sextile between two benefic planets versus a trine. Let's take Venus and Mars for example again. Venus sextile Mars will have the native believe pretty strongly in the idea of having sex and love be one in the same or having love with sex and having sex with love, but it's not going to be strong enough to keep them from having casual sex, for example. And while that seems like all fine and dandy, a lot of times it does create issues for the Venus sextile Mars person because they do have this internal belief that those two things should be one in the same, but they don't have enough follow through to always follow through with those beliefs. And sometimes it would benefit that person to just have a stronger trine so that their actions could align more with this belief that they have inside of themselves. A lot of times though, a sextile is just like, you grew up believing this and then you're like, no, actually I'm okay having a little bit of casual sex. And it doesn't, cause that much problem. So it's, you know, a looser, not as strong aspect, but all in all, a pretty harmonious aspect. Now let's get into those unharmonious aspects, starting with squares. Squares are easy in terms of math and angles because they create a 90 degree angle between two planets. They create a nice little Nice little line between those two things. Square, right angle, 90 degrees, makes sense. But they are the hardest aspect to deal with. Typically, the kind of general rule of thumb is that squares happen between two planets in signs that are of the same modality. So two planets in fixed signs can create square, two planets in cardinal signs, two planets in mutable signs, bar the fact that they are opposing. I should clarify, squares happen between planets that are in signs that are of the same modality, but not compatible elements. So Aquarius and Leo are two fixed signs, but they're in air and fire, which are compatible elements. Whereas Aquarius and Scorpio are both fixed signs, but they're in air and water, which are not compatible elements, which typically don't get along in like the basic black and white rules of astrology, though there is nuance there. But again, more than anything, it's about the degrees, it's about the orb, it's about that angle in the sky, baby. And squares are hard because it's basically two planets that cannot see eye to eye, but are similar enough in terms of the modality that they grind each other's gears. Like basically, 
two planets that are squaring have the same way of going about things, but they have two completely different goals. So cardinal squares are a really great example. Cardinal squares both want to move in a direction, that's what cardinal means, but they just want to move in different directions. Fixed squares want to stay secure and safe in one certain place, but the places that they want to be in are very different. So squares bring out the nastier parts of malefic planets and they cause a lot of tension between two planets. Let's take sun square moon for example. Real big party trick is that people with sun square moon often have divorced parents because the sun is the father, the moon is the mother, parents don't see eye to eye and they end up splitting up. Not every person that has sun square moon has divorced parents, but if they don't, there at least will be this common ground of having their parents be very different, having their parents teach them very different ways or endow very different narratives to them of what they should be, what is valuable, X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. A lot of times people who don't have divorced parents but have sun square moon feel like their parents hate each other even though they're not divorced. Venus square Mars. For these people it's really hard to find someone that they feel measures up to the values that they want in a relationship and also stimulates them in a passionate way. So squares are tough aspects. Then we have the opposition. With the opposition, the line that they form in the sky is just a straight line straight through that chart. They are on opposite sides of the chart, so they're drawing a line right through it. The general rule of thumb is that these two planets will be in signs that are of the same modality and in element similar signs. So like with Aquarius Leo, those are opposing signs with Aquarius being fixed air and Leo being fixed fire. Another really quick simple way to know what opposing signs are is if you know where in the year all the zodiac signs lie, they're always six months apart. But again, the degrees matter, the orb matters. Oppositions, again, unharmonious aspect, but they have more potential to work things out between the two of them if they put the work in. With harmonious aspects, the thing is, they don't have to put the work in. The trine doesn't have to put the work in. They naturally speak the same language. Oppositions have the potential to be very powerful because they have the potential to balance each other out perfectly, but it's really hard to get them on the same page and to get them communicating harmoniously enough to create the benefits that they can. And how capable you are of making an opposition more harmonious or not depends on how many malefic planets are involved. I have Mars opposite Saturn, two malefic planets, and it is considered one of the hardest aspects. But if you were to have Sun opposite Moon, there's a lot more potential of you being a balanced person by having, you know, sun in Gemini, moon in Sagittarius. You know, you get the benefits of both of those polarities. But more often than not, any kind of opposition causes a bit of trouble because it's just like so hard to get those two planets on the same wavelength communicating to each other harmoniously and a lot of times with sun opposite moon again differences or tensions between parents i typically see that sun square moon creates a lot of tensions and divorce in parents but sun opposite moon creates differences as much 
as it creates divorces. So say that you have like Sun in Scorpio, Moon in Taurus. Um, Sun in Scorpio, you learned the impermanence of life from your father, but you learned stability and groundedness from your mother. That has the potential to have you reap the benefits of both of those polarities and become a very balanced person but it also has the potential to go massively wrong by feeling like you really, really want security, moon in Taurus, but you feel like you don't deserve it, sun in Scorpio, sense of self, and the opposition can be really tough, but with a lot of work, it can be very beneficial. So that is a quick and dirty rundown of all of the aspects. I hope that this video was beneficial to you. Let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below. I hope that it will keep me from rambling too much in future aspect videos. You can subscribe to stay tuned for more content on aspects, astrology, spirituality, and whatever else floats my boat. But that's all from me for today. I hope that you have a great rest of your day or night, and thank you for watching.